Hello, welcome to the next video lesson of chapter 17. We're going to jump into vision as our next special sense. Um, but before we get to the actual process of how you see stuff, we're going to spend some time taking a look at the eye anatomy. And there, there's a lot of parts to it. So just be prepared to do a lot of labeling on the eyeball and associated structures. Um, I also wanted to say just a, a mention between the textbook and the lab manual, um, there's quite a few terms that don't exactly match. There's alternate terms. And so I try to use those in the lecture as much as I can. Um, I would just recommend picking one term and going with it. You don't have to learn both. Just pick the one that works best for your memorization and retention um, because there's quite a few terms that are different between the, the lab manual and the textbook. And I know that's not the best thing. It's easy when everything's the same um, all over the place, but that's just not the case. There's a lot of alternative verbiage in the special senses, so just keep that in mind. Um, knowing your parts and pieces of the eyeball is going to be really helpful for your understanding of the physiology, so please make sure you don't dive too deep into the photoreception and accommodation processes until you're pretty comfortable with how the eye is put together, because that all kind of plays a part in your understanding of the physiology. All right, so first, um, before we jump into the eyeball itself, we're going to take a look at what we call the accessory structures. So these are things that are found outside of the eyeball. Um, we have the eyelids and what we call the lacrimal apparatus. So I'm just going to go through the different um, pictures here with the leader lines and just try to describe them um, and give them some explanation. So palpebrae. These are your eyelids. So you have an upper and a lower, right? So we have an upper eyelid and a lower eyelid. And eyelashes, obviously, are growing off of your palpebra. Um, when your eyes are wide open, ah, you have a large palpebral fissure. The fissure is just a space between your eyelids, OK? And then where your upper eyelid and your lower, lower eyelid meet, these are called the canthus. You have a medial canthus, which would be towards your nose. And then we have the lateral canthus, which is out here. So the canthus is just the place where your upper and lower eyelids meet on the medial and lateral sides of your eye structure. In the lab manual, this is called the commissure. So there's one of those examples of two words um, for the same thing. Um, another structure that we can see is in this anterior view is what was called what is called the lacrimal caruncle, which is that pink fleshy blob. It's more of this guy right here um, in the corner of your eye. Um, the other things that we can see on this picture are the pupil. Okay, the pupil is the hole. We'll talk about the hole um, when we get to the iris, because the iris is the, the smooth muscle, collection of smooth muscles that changes the size of the pupil. Uh, the sclera is actually part of the eyeball. We'll be looking at that um, structure on the next slide when we actually look at eyeball anatomy. And then we have this thing here called the corneal limbus. So the limbus is just that boundary between um, kind of the sclera and the cornea. The cornea kind of sticks out a little bit. So we'll see it on a lateral view um, on the next slide. All right. so before we get into the lacrimal apparatus on this other picture, I just wanted to point out some of the other accessory structures. Um, your extrinsic eye muscles are also accessory structures. Extrins there's two groups of muscles. We have extrinsic and intrinsic. Extrinsic muscles are the skeletal muscles that move your eye up, down, left, right, and around in circles. Um, and we have them listed here. So superior rectus, um, the oblique of your or the tendon of your superior oblique. Um, we have the inferior rectus and the inferior oblique. Um, there's a medial rectus and a lateral rectus, but we cannot see that on this picture. Um, all right, and there, the eyelids, right? So we can see the canthus and we can see the eyelid. Um, what else? The caruncle. Okay, so those are the things um, not associated with the lacrimal apparatus. So when we talk about lacrimal, um, you might remember that word because this is your lacrimal bone, kind of right in here. Remember that little rectangular bone that was sitting kind of right past your, we had your nasal bone a little bit of your uh, mandible, and then the lacrimal bone, and then back towards your um, sphenoid and ethmoid. So lacrimal means tear. So the lacrimal apparatus um, are all of the structures that are associated with the production, uh, drainage, um, production, release, and drainage of those tears. Now, this is kind of, doesn't 
it may come as a shock to you. I don't know if it's that shocking of information, but tears do not get secreted from the place where we normally see them coming out of our eye. This is actually the drainage spot. Tears are produced by your lacrimal glands, which are located up here, kind of back behind your orbit, back in your eyebrows. So this is a lacrimal gland. When they are stimulated to be secreted via parasympathetic activation, um, they will drain down the ducts. So the ducts go and drain the tears in a little space that's between the surface of your eye and your upper eyelid. Again, we'll see that on another picture. The tears kind of wash across the surface of your eye as you blink, right? The blinking the um, eyelids help to distribute the tears. And then over here in the very corner, right, so we have the carbuncle, that little fleshy piece, we have the medial canthus, right? that was part of our other list. But what we have now is the lacrimal punctum. Punctum means hole. And if you look close enough, there's two little black holes right here and right here. And you may have seen them in your own eye. So if you're looking really closely in the mirror and you kind of pull your eyelid down kind of this middle medial canthus, you'll see two little black specks or at least one on the inferior, there's one on the superior. That, those are little holes that drain the tear from the surface of your eye through the little canaliculi, superior and inferior canaliculi. So these are little tubes that go from the punctum into the lacrimal sac, okay, which is this kind of collection chamber here. And that drains down the nasolacrimal duct and it empties just underneath your uh, inferior nasal conch into your nasal cavity. So when you have runny eyes or you're crying or you have excess tear production, you tend to get a stuffy or runny nose shortly afterwards. It's because that excess tears drain down into your nasal cavity. So that kind of makes sense. All right. So those are your accessory eye structures and um, the lacrimal apparatus. There's one other thing that I'm going to talk to you about on the next slide that is a uh, accessory structure, it is the conjunctiva, but I have a better picture on the next slide. Okay, so those are the accessory structures. So now we're going to take a look at the eyeball anatomy itself. So the eyeball is a spherical globe like structure made up of three tunics or layers. So the three tunics, the outermost layer is called the fibrous tunic, the middle layer is called the vascular tunic, and the innermost layer is called the neural tunic. So this is another place where you see um, different words. So in the lab, they just use sclera and cornea. They don't call fibrous tunic. Um, they don't really use the word tunics in the lab. Um, they just use the subdivisions. But I do because I kind of like that organization. It helps me kind of compartmentalize things a little bit better. So of the fibrous tunic, the outermost layer, the bulk of it is made up of that, the white of your eye, right? So the white of your eye, this is what we call the sclera, and then the cornea is the clear covering. This guy right here, we can see that down here in the side view that sticks out and that's actually what you see through. Okay? So those two components make up the fibrous tunic. The vascular tunic has three major components to it. We have the iris, which is the colored part of your eye that changes the shape of the pupil, which was the hole. We have what's called the ciliary body, which is a collection of smooth muscles which changes the shape of the lens. So we can think iris, is pupil and ciliary body is lens. Not that that's what they are, but that's what they regulate. So they're both smooth muscles. So the iris is a smooth muscle that regulates the pupil size, ciliary body is smooth muscle that regulates the lens shape. And then the choroid is um, a layer of vascular tissue, very, very rich in blood vessels. All right. And then the neural tunic, the third layer, um, we have the neural part, which is where your rods and cones are located. Um, sometimes called the retina, and then the pigmented part, which is the um, a layer of like simple cuboidal epithelium with high levels of melanin. We'll see that a little bit uh, in a close-up picture of the retina. All right, so that's the major organization of the eyeball in the three tunics, um, and we do have some open spaces inside that are filled with fluid. So we have the posterior cavity is all of the space behind the lens, and the anterior cavity is all of the space in front of the lens. Okay, so posterior and anterior, that makes sense. And we'll talk about the fluids that are found in those here in a little bit. All right. So moving down to this bottom picture, we can see some of those um, accessory structures, right? So here we have our palpebra. It's not labeled, but there's our upper eyelid and there's our lower eyelid. 
and we have um, that location. So our gland was going to be delivering the tears into that region called the fornix. The fornix is just a word that means like a tight fold, something that is like that. So a tight fold of tissue. So there's a fornix, which is the space between your upper eyelid and the surface of your eye. And this is where we have our conjunctiva, right? So I said, I was going to mention the conjunctiva. So the conjunctiva is a very thin see-through layer of epithelium that covers the surface of the sclera. So it's like the lining of the sclera. And then it turns a corner in the fornix and then lines the back side of your palpebra. So depending on where that conjunctiva is located, it, got, it has two names. So you have ocular conjunctiva, which is called bulbar conjunctiva in your lab manual, or palpebral conjunctiva, right? So ocular, it's on the surface of the eye, or palpebral, it's on the surface of the eyelid. And what that allows is instead of the skin and muscle of the eyelid rubbing up against the connective tissue of the sclera, it's these two smooth, flat um, epithelial layers rubbing up against each other, which reduces friction, and it's lubricated by the tears. And you have the same thing down here. You'll have a palpebral conjunctiva and ocular conjunctiva on your lower eyelid as well. Here we can see the limbus a little bit better. It's just that border between would be up here as well. And the border between the sclera and the cornea. Um, and also in the side view, we can kind of see the iris and the pupil a little bit better and the lens and the ciliary body. Again, the muscles that regulate the shape of the lens and the iris is the muscles that regulate the shape of the pupil. Okay. Here's our posterior cavity, the anterior cavity. Okay. Um, all right, and then at the very back of the eyeball, we have the optic nerve, right? So the optic nerve is a collection of a whole bunch of axons that leave the back of the eyeball and head towards the brain. All righty, so there's our sectional anatomy of the eye. So the takeaway from this, you know, other than being able to label pictures like this, is your three layers or your three tunics, um, the structures that uh, divide your anterior and posterior cavities, which is primarily the lens. Okay, so now we're going to take a closer look at the neural tunic, the retina and the pigmented epithelium. So here is the pigmented epithelium. It looks like simple cuboidal epithelium, um, and it just has a high concentration of melanin, so the dark uh, color that kind of gives skin its color. And so that is what we can see here. And you'll see this same slide in lab. So it is this blackish layer here. And then outside of it, here's all that vascular part of the vascular tunic, the choroid. So the cells that make up the neural tunic are all neurons, which is cool because that's why it's named that, um, other than the pigmented epithelium, the retina, I should say. There are three, uh, well, there's multiple types of cells. There's three major layers, I should say. So the outermost layer that's way on the back of the retina is made up of your rods and cones. These are called photoreceptors. So photoreceptors are your rods and cones. They're at the very, very, very back of the eyeball. Then we have a layer of bipolar cells. So if you guys remember, we learned about bipolar cells. We saw a few bipolar cells in the olfactory neurons. Here's another location of bipolar cells. And then lastly, we have a layer of ganglion cells. Okay, and then there's a few scattered, what are called amacrine and Oh, amacrine cells and, oh, there we go, horizontal cells. I kind of drew over them. So amacrine cells and horizontal cells kind of are scattered between the layers. So horizontal cells are be found between the rods and cones and bipolar cells. Amacrine cells are between the bipolar and the ganglion cells. So for your, you know, kind of coordination over here, here are your rods and cones. Here are your bipolar cells. Here are your ganglion cells. So those are three major layers of these neurons. And you'll notice there's way, and although usually the dark speckles are the nuclei, because that's kind of how cells are stained. So we can see there's way more rods and cones than bipolar cells. And then there's a lot more bipolar cells than there are ganglion cells. And we're going to be talking about this at the end of the physiology lecture, is there is um, lots of convergence. So we have a whole bunch of cells here converging onto fewer cells here converging onto fewer cells here. So we get a lot of more information than what actually gets sent to the brain. A lot more information is showing up to the rods and cones than what actually gets sent to the brain. The last thing I want to talk about in this diagram before, I'm going to erase all of this stuff here.
before we move on is I wanted to talk about the pathway of light. Now, the reason why we have such a special receptor as the eyeball is because the stimulus that we have to process. Now, up to this point, it, with smell and taste included, most of the stimulus that we've been talking about that triggers action potentials is the arrival of a chemical, right? So the neuromuscular junction back in chapter 10, acetylcholine showed up, crossed the synaptic cleft, bound to receptor, opened ion channels, sodium rushed in, we activated the muscle. Same type of process when we took a look at neuron and at, um, neuron physiology in chapter 12, the arrival of a graded potential, neuro, uh, neurotransmitter showed up, open channels, sodium rushed in, triggered an action potential. Smell and taste, it was the arrival of chemical signals, right? So odor molecules, taste molecules, binding to receptors, depolarizing the cell. Well, what about light? Light is not a chemical. We cannot rely on the same types of receptors that we have seen up until this point. So we need a very special way to convert light energy into action potentials. We know how action potentials work. We know we have to get ch channels open. So we have to open sodium channels somehow. So what is the mechanism that that's going to happen? Well, that's all going to be in the physiology video. But before we get there, we need to know that light comes in through your cornea, through the pupil, through the lens. The lens focuses a light on your retina. And so then here comes the light. The light actually passes through the bipolar cells, the ganglion cells and the bipolar cells. There's no reception for light in those first two layers. So the light actually goes all the way past that. And it is in this, these outer rod and cone shaped pieces of the photoreceptors where the light actually gets converted to a chemical message. And then we have action potentials leaving and going towards the optic nerve. So it's a very cool process. The eyeball is an amazing structure. To be able to convert light energy, wavelengths of electromagnetic energy, and convert that into action potentials that our brain then knows what to do with. So that's the whole function of your rods and cones is converting light energy into action potentials and synaptic activity. It's so amazing. All right, so that's our closer look at our neural tunic. So then kind of putting all these pieces together, this would be another great diagram to practice labeling to make sure you're hitting all of the structures that you can see. Um, the main takeaway from this one that I wanted to talk about is um, this little structure here that I didn't really mention before. It's called a fovea. The fovea is a little indentation in kind of where the retina is in the back of the eyeball. This is your position of um, clearest vision. It is where you focus. So whenever you are looking around and you're focusing on something, that light will come into your eyeball and all your muscles will move things around and move your lens around to make that light that you are focusing on land right on your retina, on that fovea, sorry. So for me right now, I am focusing on the little camera and the light and the little words that are on my screen, like right up in here. So that tells me that the information coming from that part of my computer is going straight into my eye and landing on my fovea because that's my clearest vision. But I see other stuff. I see my window shade. I can see part of my kitchen over here and my other you know, work computer over here, but it's not in focus. That would be light kind of coming in here and landing on this part of my retina or light coming in here and landing on this part of my retina. I can still see it, but it's not in focus. If I were to look over and focus at, you know, this computer over here, then my visual access when I'm looking over here, my screen, this part right here that used to be clear, is now landing elsewhere on my retina. So it is the fovea, which is the point of clearest vision. And so I think this diagram kind of shows that relationship the best. Okay. The other thing I wanted to mention in this diagram is the optic disc, this guy right here. We'll see, I think I got a close up um, slide coming up. The optic disc is a location on the back of the eyeball where the optic nerve leaves the eyeball and takes all of that visual information towards the brain for processing. Okay, um, okay um, let's see, what else? Oh, posterior cavity. This has a good breakdown of the anterior cavity because to confuse, you know, new a and students, let's just break a cavity up into smaller spaces called chambers. So here, from lens to cornea, this whole space is the anterior cavity. But the um, 
iris right here separates the posterior chamber from the anterior chamber of the anterior cavity. Isn't that fun? So we have an anterior chamber and a posterior chamber of the anterior cavity. So figure out what you need to do to get that straightened up. It's the lens that is, or sorry, the lens separates anterior cavity from posterior cavity. It is the iris that separates anterior chamber from posterior chamber within the anterior cavity. Okay. All right. Let's see what's next. All right. Here is a closer look of that retina and the optic disc. And so here again, we can identify our layers. Here's our sclera, thick connective tissue, mostly collagen fibers. Here is our choroid. It's going to be very vascular. Right? All the blood supply to the eyeball. Here's our pigmented epithelium. And then here's our neural part. Okay, pigmented part, neural part of the tunic of the retina. You know, whatever the terminology that sits best for your brain. And again, the light is coming back here. Light, light. Oops, that's not. I guess I could be red light. <laughs> So light's coming back, penetrates through the ganglion cells, penetrates through the bipolar cells, goes all the way to the outer part of the photoreceptor cells. Here is where it gets converted to action potentials. And then it leaves via the bipolar cells, action potentials of the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells, and then out the axons, which will then send that visual information towards your visual cortex and with a couple stopovers before it reaches that point. So here again is where we go from light information coming in, converting to action potentials going out this way. Okay. And then here's that optic disc. Now, if you'll notice in this particular region that I've called coloring in here, there's no rods and cones here. So there's a region on the back of our eyeball where we cannot pick up any information. It's called the blind spot, the optic disc or the blind spot. There's a little test that you can do. We do it in lab, it's in your book. I think it's on my next slide where you can actually test your, optic, uh, your blind spot. Oh, and here it is right here. So here is our fovea within what's called the macula lutea. It's like the dent, so that's your point of sharpest focus. And then the blind spot, this is where you um, do not pick up any visual information. So you usually cover one eye. So if I'm going to cover my right eye, I'm going to use my left eye. I'm going to look at the circle because it's off. And I just go close. Oh, right. Okay, so I'm seeing the circle. The X is there. The X disappears. So what that means is the light of the X is coming into my eyeball. And that visual, that light of the X is landing on the blind spot. And my brain can't see that it's... <laughs> There's nothing there. There's no information coming in when that particular shape lands on this particular spot of my eye. Now, the reason why when both eyes are open that we don't see big blank spots is because our brain fills in the um, missing information. It's not the missing data. The data is not there because we can clearly see that it's gone once we get right here. If I go like this, the circle goes away. Um, try it. It's kind of fun. Um, but our, when our, our, both of our eyes are open, we can fill in the missing data. It's more the processing, those ex, um, association areas, than the actual um, data that your brain is perceiving. All right, so that's our blind spot. We talked about that. Okie dokie. Okay, so now we're going to take a closer look at um, the chambers of the eye. So we already talked about how the uh, anterior cavity is broken up into the anterior and the posterior chambers. And then the posterior cavity is everything posterior to the lens. Now we can talk a little bit about the fluids. So your um, posterior cavity holds some fluid called vitreous humor. Okay, so vitreous humor is this jelly-like blob of goop that sits in your posterior cavity. It is there when you're born, you have it your whole life, you don't recycle it, you don't make more, it's just part of your eyeball structure. It's kind of sealed within your eyeball. And there's like a little membrane here that kind of keeps that from leaking and spilling out and separating into the anterior cavity. Then in the anterior cavity, we have fluid that's called aqueous humor. Okay, so aqueous humor is more liquidy, more watery, and uh, less viscous, and it does get produced and recycled on a daily basis. So vitreous humor is non-recyclable, you don't make more, you don't lose any, um, 
in a healthy individual. Aqueous humor is you are always making new, and we can see that over here, aqueous humor is secreted from cells in the ciliary body, the collection of muscles, we can kind of follow those little red arrows, secretes and kind of hangs out uh, surrounding the lens. It kind of washes through the opening of the pupil, and then it gets recycled in these little open spaces called the scleral venal sinus. Now, if you have an older edition, which was one of my favorite words, and I'm kind of bummed they took it out, but it was named after a person, so you know, I guess that's their pattern. It was called the Canal of Schlem. What an awesome name. That's an O. So the Canal of Schlem is now called the scleral venal sinus. So again, you might see that older term, but that is the source of recycling for the aqueous humor. So we're constantly producing aqueous and recycling it on a daily basis. Okay. Um, another structure that I wanted to mention here, since this is such a good close-up picture of the ciliary body um, and the control of the lens, is what we call the ciliary zonule, or what I like to call suspensory ligaments. Not me, it's also in your lab manual. It's not just my word. I just like suspensory ligaments better because it's a little bit more descriptive. So the suspensory ligaments extend from the ciliary body and then they go and they hook to all the way around the lens and they are what are responsible. So when the ciliary body contracts and relaxes, that's what changes the shape of the lens. We're going to talk about that. It's called accommodation in the physiology video. Okay. All right. So those are the uh, chambers and the fluids and suspensory ligaments and the lens. Okay. So then lastly, um, just a little blurb on the iris and the pupil. So we've mentioned the ciliary body was a smooth muscle that changes the shape of the lens. Again, we'll see that again. The iris is a collection of smooth, mus smooth muscle that changes the shape of the pupil. Um, it is a collection of two patterns of smooth muscle tissue. So we have our constrictor muscles here. I'll put in green, these guys here. And then we have our dilator muscles. I'll put those in blue. So dilator muscles are going in this orientation here. So if we need to constrict our pupil, we are going to have the constrictors. Oops. We're going to have the constrictors constrict. Doo, 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 doo. Right? So those muscles are going to be activated and they'll go zoop, and we can see the pupil gets really small. Okay. And the um, Dilator muscles, the radial muscles just kind of go along for the ride. They're relaxed, but they're stretchy. They're smooth muscle. They're kind of stretchy. If we want um, pupils to dilate, right? So this guy's got huge pupils. So what we do is the sphincter muscles kind of relax and the dilator muscles are now going to be pulling in all directions to open up the pupil and make it big. So they're all kind of going in this direction, pulling outwards. So then you're going to get a dilated pupil. So what triggers these changes? And we're going to be getting to do this in lab as well. So uh, in high light intensity, right? So high light intensity, you're going to have a constricted pupil to protect our retina, but it also is activated by parasympathetic stimulation. So when you're in rest and digest, your pupils tend to be a little bit smaller. When you are in dark, right? darkness, think movie theater or a dark room, um, will cause a pupil dilation so we can get more light coming in to make, um, to learn information about our environment. But we also have sympathetic activation causes vasodilation, uh -huh, pupil dilation, um, which will allow you again to take in more information in that crisis fight or flight mode. Okay. All right. So that's our video on eye anatomy. Um, I will see you next time. I'm going to have two editions of visual physiology. So just be ready for that. Um, okay. Bye.